Right now, we uh, are just about to hear a talk from Michael Shlo von Benevitz uh, about the state of Monero hardware. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Brandon. So, right, this is going to be a whirlwind tour of some of the most current devices that we're working on. Um, we'll talk about two new devices. One is called Monero Shield, and one is called one is called Monero Metal. And um, then we'll see some wallets, see some current state of the wallets, including the enclosure. It's a PLA polylactide. Um, 3D printed and talk maybe if we have time about injection molding, which is uh, on the roadmap as well. We'll take a look at badges at the end. Uh, so basically what all of these devices are doing, what we kind of, um, our common uh, goals, Monero hardware, is that um, they're storing secrets and protecting them, controlling access to uh, secret keys used to sign documents or to control access to spend keys so that we can spend our money wisely and safely. Um, this, is a, this is kind of a preview device now. It's called Monero Shield now, but who knows what it will be called next year. Yeah, this thing is not very hard. <laughs> Maybe I'm too tall or the microphone is too short. So, and this is the way it looks. Uh, I just made a photo of it because I wasn't sure that this wonderful camera would work. What do you think of that? Uh, let's focus. And this is the first ever Monero Shield device. It's a, it's a, a passive device. It has no electronics. And it's basically an RF shield. It's a Faraday cage. And I won't mention the um, other manufacturers of these, but usually the, the, the shield that, that uh, shields the devices being worked on is about the size of a closet or a garage, costs four to 700,000 euros, and can, um, can defeat EMPs, uh, electromagnetic pulses. So if you're in a city and you're trying to uh, model a, what the things that, I have to watch my words, what the, the types of uh, activities that would cause an EMP, then you basically don't want to shut down the, electro, the electrical grid of a city, and so you use a shield for that. That's the typical use case for uh, this type of RF shield. What we're trying to do is shrink that and make it portable. So we have a shoebox size, or in this case, because I can put that in my suitcase, a uh, a smartphone size, you walk in the room, a meeting room, you've got maybe a room full of uh, well-trusted journalists or, um, or enterprise uh, managers, and you want to uh, protect your secrets from, um, from attacks, you simply put the device in the Monero shield, and it blocks all RF, and you can have your meeting. So that's just one of the use cases for the new Monero shield. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do this kind of whirlwind quite fast uh, because we don't have much time and the very last device may be the more, most important. I don't even have a sample of this. It's at the printers right now. It's made of steel. Uh, ANZ1430 steel is uh, the type um, because of its electrical characteristics. It has less chrome. And this is basically a paper wallet, but it's, uh, um, it's able to withstand uh, high temperatures, fires, buildings. You drop it in the bottom of the ocean, and you can possibly locate it with a magnetometer or something like that. So it's a, it's a very, um, uh, very reliable type of passive wallet, uh, useful for backing up uh, your smartphone wallet, wherever you have your wallet. You might want to have a passive wallet on top of that, like a paper wallet. Well, it's Monero Metal is our new device to provide that. Uh, I think most people already know what the Castello wallet is, but here's a kind of an update on the status. Um, I have a couple devices working here. Um, let's see if I can, there we go. And then I will zoom in. There we go, nice and close. And so just a, quite, uh, a quick, quick rundown of what the features are at the time. It does create a, a full Monero wallet, but it doesn't support the features that you might typically expect, like uh, uh, verifying, spending, um, uh, sending up across uh, a network to the blockchain, and so on. Um, so let me try that one instead. This one has a battery. It's made for presentation purposes. 
and I need to, so we're not going to be able to, yeah. Yeah, the, the enclosure is not allowing me to push the button, unfortunately. <laughs> but, so this is the enclosed wallet. Um, I'll have to show you how it works after the presentation. Um, so I'll give you a quick, sh quick demonstration of uh, how we developed this. It's a program called KiCad. And it's all on GitHub, so you can download the sources. Um, this is my presentation computer. I don't really know how to use Windows. What is this? Okay, anyway, so this is KiCad. This is a schematic. This is describing the different commu communications between all of the chips and traces. Um, and for hardware engineers, the schematic is kind of the first, uh, first, how do you do this? Um, the first means of understanding what the circuits do, what the device does. This is the biggest chip in the middle. It's an ARM Cortex M3 uh, ISA instruction set architecture. And we're doing some things with a second um, uh, platform, which I'll talk about later. So that's the schematic. And here's the layout. This is what the actual board looks like. So if I take this and zoom in a bit. This is the same thing. If you look at those circles there, those are mount holes to come onto the enclosure. And we go back to the camera. And now I'll just move that over. This is the, the uh, circuit board which is inside. And you can see those th same three mount holes. Right? So the only thing missing on the, on the layout diagram is the, is the display, which is not relevant for laying out uh, parts. Anyway, so that's how that looks. The back side is like this. Made a note about the USB pins having a problem on that particular plat uh, uh, platine PCB. OK, so that's KiCad. That's what we're using to develop the, the hardware with. And we're doing FreeCAD for the mechanical engineering. Let me show that. So if you're wondering how this thing is made with a hole there, the USB to C connector that's inside, um, that's made with KiCad. So here we have the enclosure. And if I just drop this, then I can kind of spin it around. This is, this is a 3D modeling for a FDM, a fused deposition modeling uh, printer, or a 3D printer. And we make some changes when we send this to the uh, plastics manufacturing for shooting ABS, or PC polycarbonate plastic. Um, but mostly, this is the FDM. I can't, why can't I rotate this? Oh, that's not rotating too well. I don't know why. Yeah, I just, uh, is that frozen? <laughs> I think Windows is kind of, whatever. So, <laughs> so anyways, that's the um, polycarbonate. Uh, we're probably going to do a polycarbonate ABS hybrid um, enclosure. We had a, a survey. Not sure if you all noticed about a month ago, we had the first survey to ask the community what color the enclosure should be. We can, we can do things with multiple colors when we're printing them individually uh, on a piece-by-piece -piece case basis uh, like this. But when we do uh, real professional enclosure uh, engineering, we're going to have to choose a single type of plastic and a single um, um, enclosure color. And it was decided to do an orange translucent color, so 60% um, opacity uh, or, or transparency. And uh, the top plate will be clear like this uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, so that we can have a very simplified design for the display that shines through. If the top plate was, for example, black color or orange, you wouldn't see the display. We would have to cut a hole out and do some more engineering. So we're just trying to keep things down to a minimum complexity. And all of the other sides will be orange. And the design is actually at the at the um, manufacturer right now, they've asked for some modifications due to the draft angle and due to the supports for the PCB inside, which caused the, uh, the molten plastic to not pop out of the 
mold. Um, so we're going to make those uh, uh, changes and send it in another week or two, and possibly the first uh, T1, that's the, the test um, round of a small batch of about 100 enclosures might be in our hands in a couple months, maybe even a month and a half. So that's the status of the enclosure um, and the Ca Castillo hardware wallet. Uh, we do have, so I will say I have some sample uh, developer kits. They're blue colored um, and I have at least three. Uh, I'd like to give those out. I'm actually very enthusiastic about putting those in, in your hands. So um, if you think you can do something meaningful with it, like outside of, except of, you know, uh, taking a look at it once on the plane and then you get home and it uh, stays in a drawer, <laughs> please, <laughs> if, you, if you can do something meaningful with a wallet, then come up to me after the presentation or even better, catch me some other place. Um, I'll be sitting in the crowd and I'll give you a, a developer kit. It looks exactly like this. Oops, you can't see that. It looks exactly like this, but it's blue color. So it has an enclosure, buttons, just no batteries inside. Right, so that would be very nice of you to test that device out, maybe uh, contribute something. Um, yeah, when we're doing uh, PCB engineering, uh, some hardware theory that we pay attention to is that each of our devices has an MCU. We're not doing much with MPUs or high uh, power 40 watt TDP type uh, platforms. We're doing everything very low power, so even battery power is, is an option. Um, so that's what MCU stands for, microcontroller unit. Um, lots with um, uh, ARM-based uh, mi microcontrollers, Cortex-M3, M4, but we're considering other platforms, um, which is another slide, maybe do some RISC-V. Um, we think of program storage, how much we need, but what type of storage that is as well. If it's secure storage, it means that the physical chip has probably a mesh, which makes it very difficult to decapsulate with sulfuric acid, these type of secure um, features. Uh, debug interfaces, uh, typical is JTAG or SWD, single wire debug. So that's how you actually get the, uh, the, the firmware onto the chip because the chip doesn't have a hard drive. It doesn't have any external storage. So we're using the debug interface to get um, information in and out during development. Um, the input and output is important to uh, keep in mind when we're doing things like buttons and displays, but USB communications as well. There's been requests for NFC and some radio, which we're kind of, we won't be doing that in the beginning for the uh, risk that it carries. Um, we don't have our wonderful shield working yet, so we want to stay away from RF communications if possible, at least in the very beginning. Some of our colleagues, like uh, Matthew Stefan from the Multipass, uh, he does excellent work. If you haven't, I even, I have a Multipass. If you're interested in knowing how a Multipass um, uh, stores and defends your secrets, which is the same thing as a hardware wallet, it just will defend your passwords instead of your uh, cryptocurrency keys. And he does great work. His next, um, uh, his next uh, uh, version of the multipass is going to have RF in it, so we're kind of maybe following in his uh, steps, but we haven't done any RF yet. The input and output is limited to cable-based in our situation. Uh, On-chip security is always important, um, especially if you're doing ED25519 and Edwards Key Montgomery, uh, Montgomery Curve type things, because not much uh, off the um, counter hardware supports this, but we're seeing some new um, platforms come out that we may be able to use um, in the future. Uh, I even have, I have one to show, I think. Um, so uh, the last of our uh, Monero hardware landscape um, re status report relates to badges. Um, we're doing a number of badges for different groups, events, um, and so I don't want to be too specific, um, but I will give a preview of one of the badges that we're working on. And it looks like this, and it's called the Monero Rising. So I'm not sure. I have so many prototypes that I don't. I don't even know what they all do anymore. Let's just let's just cross our fingers and find out what this one does. They all have batteries, so I think they turn on. So this one probably. Okay, this one. This one. 
Yeah, this one, this one is uh, intends to test the input. So it has capacitive touch sensors at the bottom. You can see those three right there. And the intention of this firmware, I mean, it doesn't look very good. It does almost nothing. Um, but if you touch one of the sensors, then a second light comes on. And so that's kind of the state of, uh, of progress that we're at right now. This should be ready in about a month. And um, we have some time to uh, develop the firmware. Um, I do have some samples of these as well. I'd really uh, um, appreciate your help in um, developing some firmware for this, uh, animations and input sequences, uh, features that you'd like to see in this device. So that's the one that tests the input. So we have a couple others here. Is that box empty? Yeah. This one probably... Okay, so this one tests every single one of the 67 LEDs that are on there. We want to make sure that we can activate or turn one on individually and turn it off. We've had some problems. In fact, that's the reason that we have all of these wires going everywhere because the, the problems that we had were that uh, parts of this array were lighting up when they shouldn't. So this is simply a, a correction of that. And as you see, all of the lights independently light up. That's really boring. So let's see what this one does. And now this one is a different color, which I think I canceled this color. I don't know. If, if you like colors, just please tell me, uh, because we're probably going to do only white on this. Um, <laughs> right? Anyway, so this turns all of the lights on um, in, a, in a very ineffic inefficient sequence. So that's why you can see that it's kind of going from that way to that way. Um, right, and this is what the panels look like. This is actually what happens when we get them back from the from the printers, from the PCB, the printed circuit board fabricators, before we assemble. And uh, something I'd like to point out, because it's kind of a pioneering piece of work, is that we're doing uh, multiple nested footprints. So these two things here, I probably have to zoom into that. Um, you can see like one row of contacts inside another. And what we're doing there is trying to create one PCB that can support two different parts which are selectively uh, populated. So obviously, if I put a chip that is, uh, that is uh, contacting with all of the outside legs, it's going to cover the board there. I can't put another chip under, underneath it. It's a selective uh, mutual exclusion. But that can support two different chips. And uh, we kind of got that idea from Wixer, the designer of uh, the DEF CON badges. And, um, yeah, that's one of the pioneering features. There's a couple other things. This will have a, a lithium polymer ion, uh, a lithium ion uh, battery that's rechargeable as well. Um, and if you look on the side, it has a USB-C connector, which is kind of cool. Fortunately, no data going in and out of that. So that's a Monero rising badge. Um, we'll probably have some cool, uh, some cool lanyards to go with that. Focus, please. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's, uh, there's a couple other badges uh, in the works, um, but there's not that much time. Um, and I don't think I'm going to do a demonstration of how to engineer the firmware, because I don't know if I have VS Code on here. Or platform I.O. What do you think? Do you have, do I have this? This is, the demo, this is the presentation computer, so. So it's not the one I use for, no, I don't have platform I.O. Um, I don't know how we're going to do a workshop. If, there, if there's going to be any time at all for that here, it's going to be spontaneous if we do. But I have some um, badges as well. Let's see, this is what they look like. So if you'd like to, to take a shot at engineering some firmware, I have no, not only a badge for you, that's what they look like. They're all assembled. They work. And um, I'll give you a battery that you have to stick on the back by yourself. Then there's some uh, programming cables, which I've prepared uh, in my lab. I'm not going to take them out, but you can kind of see there's some cables in there and some programming devices. You put that in your USB 
uh, connector, and then you can program the badges that way. They're primitive devices, which means they don't have a USB circuit on board. You can't plug them uh, with a USB connector into your computer and have data communications, so you can't program them that way in the traditional way that you would with an Arduino or something. They're just too primitive for that. They're very low cost. Um, but I will uh, help you if you want to experiment by giving you one of these cables, and that way you can program them. Um, so that was the Monero Rising badge. Uh, these, yeah, these uh, CR2052 uh, batteries didn't work out, so we're going to do lithium polymer ion. Um, on this badge, we have three different interesting sensors. I already demonstrated the capacitive touch sensor, um, which basically uses the ground in your body uh, to d decide if you're touching the sensor with your finger or not. Um, there's a couple others. Um, there's an ALS, an ambient light sensor, which is on the front. I won't even try to show it. It's way too small. Uh, it's like the, about one-fourth the size of a rice kernel. <laughs> okay, it's, you can't see it. But um, you can feel it with your finger. And it's on the front and basically gives you a voltage. If you put it in a light, a strong light, like in the sunlight, it will give you maybe a high voltage. And if you put it in a closet, which is dark, or a suitcase, which has no light inside, then it will read close to zero. And that's a key idea. A suitcase, which is dark, and you have your badge in the suitcase, and it's turned on and reading light. Now, what would happen if an evil maid opened your suitcase to look for your whatever secrets and private things, and light streamed into your suitcase? Maybe you're getting the idea that this badge device can actually support an intrusion detection uh, application. So that's one of the firmware uh, features that we will have if we get that far, if we all cooperate and collaborate and actually work together and maybe somebody can help by um, testing or uh, yeah, making some firmware that supports like a evil made detector attack or something. So that's kind of in the future, but I'm really hopeful that we have some interesting things like that. Another possible feature would be the party mode where everyone in a club or at least the ones wearing the badge um, will have their animations, their flashes, whatever the badges are doing synchronized according to the music, the loud drum beats or whatever, the typical type of music you have in a party or in a club atmosphere. And the way we do that is that we have a microphone on the uh, badge, so, and you can desolder the microphone as well. It's relatively easy to remove. Um, I'll even help you with that. I know that some people are very averse to this type of um, what uh, light sensor, audio sensor, but I will um, reassure you that the microphone can only output voltages, so it's not capturing waveforms. It can't do anything like uh, store uh, what uh, a dog barking or your voice or any kind of sound in its environment. It can only real-time tell you exactly at that microsecond what the, uh, the audio volume that it's detecting is in, a, in the form of a voltage. Okay, so what that can tell you is that if there's a loud drum beating on that one microsecond, and if you detect that and you have a firmware that supports something like a party mode, you could have the entire row of, um, <laughs> of Monero party individuals uh, just kind of lighting up all at once. So that's kind of another idea, which may or may not um, come into the firmware. I hope it does. Um, but those are the different sensors on the device. Um, we do have some ideas in the future which are going to take some time to fully research, but for ECDSA and maybe Schnorr algor algorithm uh, digital signatures, we're looking at uh, a brand new chip, which isn't even on the market yet, and I'm really hopeful that they don't require an NDA to obtain these, an NDA is a non-disclosure agreement, because we would be forced to reject that uh, hardware if they did. But it's called the, uh, the NXP SC050. It's, it has some other names as well. It's early on enough that their, the, their marketing is not stable, but they, uh, they support brain pool and a couple other curves, and they support the Montgomery and Edwards curves, ED205519, the one that we, are, we care so much about. So that's interesting for us. Uh, CryptoCell is, a, is an architecture from ARM, directly from ARM, which is integrated in a few uh, different hardware products like the Nordic Semiconductor NRF52840. Um, we've been looking at that chip for a long time. Uh, Secure Boot is on our roadmap with the CEC1702. We actually have a hardware wallet that in integrates that. And what I'm actually very intrigued about, but we haven't had time to research it fully, is a RISC-V architecture. So I'm going to end the presentation by showing that chip. 
um, because I just came back from China and met the manufacturers. They gave me some, some preview samples. This is really messy, sorry. Clean up this mess. <laughs> so anyway, and this is what a, um, uh, a RISC-V chip looks like. RISC-V is hot stuff because you actually own the hardware. There's no black boxes, there's no secrets. It's an open source hardware. Let's see how well we can see that. This is probably as close as I can get. So we have a BGA uh, uh, package on the bottom. Those are all little balls that contact with the PCA, uh, with the PCB. And this one is called a Kendrite K2, K210. So if you get excited about hardware, then that's why I'm ending with the picture of a chip. And I would invite questions. And as well, if you want a wallet, then come up. Uh, I'm sorry, not a wallet, a Castello device. <laughs> and uh, have some badges as well. Any questions? Those, that's not a question. <laughs> OK. Haven't used it. Having just listened to, your, to the previous talk, and my question would be, and this is thinking out loud, uh, how difficult it would be to create a miniaturized Geiger counter that would measure background radiation as a source of randomness for a hardware wallet? Well, I think it would be very difficult because the devices I've seen, the sensors that measure this type of radiation in the spectrum are tubes. They look like they're, they're as big as your thumb. So you'd have to somehow secure that with some type of adhesive onto the hardware wallet. So my impression, not having too much experience with Geiger counters, <laughs> is that it would be too difficult because of the format and the size of the sensor itself. Um, it's, it's obviously a very good idea, maybe for other security devices. And this same idea, if you rephrase it, something like uh, instead of sensing uh, radiation in the, in the environment, sensing temperature, uh, movement, acceleration, all of these different things, and you can make a mixture of these uh, benchmarks. You know, but it's, you're on the right track for uh, trying to uh, develop a nonce using a good amount of, of chaos. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, what uh, controller are you using on the uh, Monero badge? There are two controllers right now. Uh, we have because we have two formats. Uh, two uh, we, anyway, um, and one of them, the one that I just showed you, is a um, STM thirty two F four zero five RETG, um, but it's not the one that we that we're actually going to support in the future. That's a, a L. It's a STM thirty two L four eighty six whatever, I think RGT6. And so that's a low power variant of it because we are doing some experimentation with batteries. We want to do some uh, low power. Um, and the, I'm sorry, the other one is a microchip CEC1702, which gives a secure boot, immutable boot, and a couple other features. I think the EDT, ED25519 is built in as well. And, and are you uh, programming that through JTAG? Y yes. Um, the, well, well we're programming that through JTAG, but we have a, a USB DFU um, de um, device firmware update over the USB port because all of these um, microcontrollers actually, it, the, the STM uh, supports uh, USB natively and the CEC, we're adding a, um, uh, a side labs um, USB circuit to it. So that's how we're doing that. Great. Thank you very much again, Michael. Uh, You're welcome.